two, one. What's up, buddy? It's good What's to up, see you. How you doing? I'm great, man. It's a pleasure, man. It's, uh, like I said before, dude, um, scheduling has been a pain in the ass. So I'm really, yeah. I'm really thankful that you, uh, you bear with me for a bit and I'm glad we got to sit down and do this. Um, cause yeah, we've been trying to get this going for like the last three months. So minimum. So yeah, <laughs> it's a we, pleasure, man. We talked about this when I was deployed too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We talked about this, I think back in like October of last year or so. It's yeah. been a long time coming to be able to finally sit down and have conversations. <laughs> yeah, man. So how have you been like since getting back? Like you, like you were talking about a little bit earlier, you went out to Maryland, you, you went out, came back. How's life? You know, it's, it's going good, man. Um, through work and through still going to school and everything, you know, I think my schedule's hectic at times and a lot like you to where there's just 101 things to accomplish. And it seems like there's not enough time in the day at points, yep. but I've also like recognized that, you know, I'm finding grace in it, if that makes sense. I'm just really being able to enjoy the day-to-day lifestyle to where, um, I don't know, man, I look at it as a, if I was a kid, right? In the sense of if seven, eight-year-old me was looking at what I'm doing right now, he'd be like, yo, like I'm a hero type thing. <laughs> and like, I, I kind of maintain that mentality with my day-to-day lifestyle. Like, man, little, little, little Ramon or little Luna, however you know me by, is out there just like going crazy about everything I've been able to do, so. I keep that mentality when I go through my day-to-day lifestyle, man. No, and that's, that's smart, dude. And I, I try to remind myself of the same, you know, right. whether things are going really great. And especially recently when things maybe aren't like, not necessarily not going great, but you know, life gave me a little bit of a reshuffle, you know, right. and it's like, without getting into too much detail about it, but like, you know, it, one of the, amongst the many, one of the things that kind of made me think was like, all right, I was doing a lot of things that I enjoyed for, you know, five to six, like really doing it for like five to six months, like this podcast included and things were going right. all right. There were obviously parts of my life that weren't, but like professionally and like, like side hustle wise, things were going pretty well. But then when something is at the foundation of my life was cut out, you know, it's like, right. okay, well, how bad do you want this other stuff? Like how much are you willing mm-hmm. to work for it? And, um, you know, nothing, and I'm sure you can attest to this, you know, nothing is um, built by yourself. You know, you need right. people around you. You need, whether it's connections, whether it's friends, wh- like whatever it is, you need a support system if you're going to succeed. Nobody does this alone. Right. And uh, I've got some awesome friends, got to move in with them. I rebuilt with their help, rebuilt the studio. And uh, it's been a trip, man. But yeah, I think about like, you know, what, what, like, I'm so busy. I'm doing all this shit. I'm, I'm working. I'm doing this. I'm going to school, you know, all this. Well, <laughs> what's the alternative, right? Sit around doing right. nothing. You know, <laughs> it's because it, there's, there's people who live that life and that's cool. Like if that's what makes you happy, if you want to kick it with your nine to five, come home, waste away, and then go back to work the next day, more power exactly. to you, man, whatever makes you happy. But I just, I can't, I can't find satisfaction in sitting still for too long. And I feel like, and I feel like you can attest to this, man. I feel like a lot of that came from where you and I met down at Nimi, down in Roswell, you know, you're doing right. so much shit all the time that getting out of that environment, being stagnant is so foreign. Like what, what was that experience for you down at Nimi personally? So the actual culture shock was more of when I sat there that day one and I had some 15, 16 year old dude tell me, you know, I can't go to the restroom without asking his permission. And man, it was, it was a culture shock, brother. Uh, I was thrown to the loop. And when I, my first year, my freshman year at NIMI or I think second class year, um, I played baseball there. So my schedule was tied up with playing sports. Um, and man, I, I look back on it and I think out even throughout high school. So high school, I played baseball and football, you know, I was included, uh, well, I was in our like booster club, which is kind of like our, our hype club at sports events. So I helped coordinate like a blackout or a whiteout. Um, I try to be really involved in high school. I try to be around with everything. So I was kind of used to really jumping around and having a lot of stuff to do throughout the day at NIMI. It was just the culture shock of more of that military environment. I was just not used 
to having people that I didn't see as fit to tell me what to do, but because they had a rank on their shoulder or they had been there longer than I had, you know, they, they have a reason to tell me I'm going to wake up or that first morning, I think it's, they tell you they're going to wake you up at like seven 30 or something like that. Um, and then, you know, they're banging on your door at six 15, telling you to step outside and you can smoke with all your buddies. Cause I remember, I think my first semester at Nimi was the last semester where we had to like pop two in the chow hall. Um, I think we were kind of the last, I mean, when you were CSM actually was the last time we did a lot of those, I would use military based, um, yeah. Sub, I don't want to say subjects, but events. Um, so, you know, when I first got there, I remember calling my mom the first time I got my phone back. And I was like, yo, this place crazy, man. Like, this is, <laughs> this is something else. Like, man, I'm really, we just did the confidence course. You know, like we're getting smoked in the morning before we go get breakfast. And then we go going throughout our school day. And then I go to baseball practice after that. And, you know, by the time I get to my room, it's eight o'clock at night. We have study hall. And, you know, you, you busy till 10 o'clock in the evening. Like there's stuff going on all day long, but I also use that in the sense of like how my mom is, man. My mom is a grinder. She is a hustler, dude. Like she's working 14, 16 hour days regularly, man. She, she, she put out to show that she's going to try to give me the best life she thought, like she could possibly afford me. And she's been like that since she was my age. And so I think that working hard and trying to, you know, fill up my plate is doable because I saw her do it my whole life. And did that affect, you know, the times I could spend as far as, like, she was busy, man. I remember for – there were some times where I only saw her on, like, Sundays and Mondays because, you know, she would be picking me up at 11 o'clock at night from my nana's house. And then, you know, she would carry me out to the car, put me in the car, take me home. I'll pass out. I'll wake up in the morning. She's helping me get ready for school, drops me off at school, and I won't see her again until, you know, midnight the next that, – that evening. So, you know, there was times where – I saw that and I was like, do I want to work that hard? But then you get to that age and it's like, if I not doing that, I feel like it's almost a disservice to the effort that my family's put in to get me to where I am today. So I hear you, bro. I, I hear you when it's busy schedules definitely pay a toll, not just on your physical, but your mental too. It's just like, you're trying to balance everything through this, you know, whether you want to call it spiritual, mental and physical trifecta and you know, all that stuff weighs down on you, man. I, I hear you. I hear you for sure. No, yeah, it definitely does after a while. And that's interesting that you bring up how your mom acted and how you saw her, well, not how she acted, like how she conducted her day-to-day -day, her day-to-day -day life. Growing up yeah. around that, did you kind of have to recall on that? Did you kind of have to reflect on that as this schedule was imposed on you starting out? Because you went there for two years um, of college, so. Yeah, two years of college, so. When I first got there, um, I actually was going there because I only going to athletic training. I, I have, did a little bit of it in high school, um, and I was already working with John down at the athletic training center, and I was fully engaged in that. I thought that was the process I was going to go on to, um, kind of being in my spiritual time, my time with God, or however you want to call it. Um, I kind of started getting – actually, it all started when I took a class with Major Captain Criminal Justice, dude. I sat in there and just the way he painted the picture of, you know, what law enforcement could do for somebody. Um, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up in a environment that wasn't very law enforcement friendly. Um, one of my male, one of my major male influences growing up was when uh, a guy my mom used to date who was locked up in prison and not getting too much into that, but going on those prison visits and, being able to have those interactions with him led me into a lot of things, whether it was like trying to be the best I can at sports. Um, he got me into like my sneaker game. He used to give me shoes for my birthday, uh, stuff like that. That's led to who I am today. Uh, all these different environments, high school, all this, I never thought I was going to try to get into law enforcement. And so then becoming an MP in the army and then, you know, working investigations and everything. It's just, it's, it's wild to me. dude. It's absolutely wild how I got to where I'm at. I know this is a long runaround, but I guess it all kind of just adds <laughs> up to how it's how it's made me think through my day to day basis. I mean, it's 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 wild to comprehend how that school and the environment of NIMI was able to alter how I looked at a lot of things and alter my work ethic. I think that's where, bro, in high school, 
I was lazy. I'm not, I'm not even going to act like I wasn't. Like I was giving my, I would say my least amount of effort I possibly can in my academics. I was not a great student. Um, I look at sports and I was a good athlete. It was just a matter of I, I didn't work hard enough for it. And I got, I looked at my friends who were great athletes who didn't work at all. And I was like, okay, well, I'm working more than them. But then I look at this dude, I'm like, I mean, I don't even know. This dude, Tanner Solomon, man. Um, I barely talked to the guy. I barely know the dude. But he worked so hard. And him and I were about the same skill set. And now this dude was throwing, you know, 93, 94 miles an hour playing college ball. And I wasn't even close to that level. So it's just seeing stuff like that to where I have people that I've looked at where I wish I would have worked harder. And so carrying that mentality into NIMI, I finally had that restart, that new, that complete fresh start to re be able to develop those training habits, those study habits. And I had a better GPA in college than I did in high school because of that environment. Uh, definitely had its, its moments where I could have done a lot better for sure. But <laughs> I think, I think that for the, looking at it with hindsight and hindsight's always 2020, 20, man, that I did really well there. So. Well, and it's interesting that you say all of that in such a, like obviously the effect on you was right. mostly, if not totally positive, but it's <laughs> interesting that you paint it that way intentionally, because I would say up until right now, every conversation I've had about the Institute, whether it's on the podcast or just throughout my life since I've graduated, you know, I would honestly say every single one of them with few exceptions, very few, was that place fucking sucked. That place mm -hmm. was this, that place was that. And if they do have anything positive to say about it, it's, you know, I'm glad I went because of the people that I met. Mm -hmm. that that is the only pause they pull out of they don't ever talk about academics they don't ever talk about the disciplinary part of it they don't talk about the habits you build there's really like none of that and even when you when i found like if i find that i do want to kind of bring that up in the conversation it's uh mm -hmm. it's pulling teeth and don't get me wrong i know a lot of people unfortunately that got fucked by the system that for sure that just didn't have a good time um, but I, what I will say, unfortunately, is a lot of the people, no, all of the people that I can say did not have a good experience and it mostly not be their fault were female without a doubt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Without actually. a fucking doubt. Like even last night, man, uh, hanging out with a friend of mine who, uh, who's an alumni of there. She's uh, two years ahead of me. She was <laughs> even telling me how like she had teachers there. That would, you know, ask to see her after class and shit like that. And, yes. you, you know, and that's just like the surface level type of um, interactions that are so unique to that demographic of, you know, cadet at the school. Because don't get me wrong. I got some I got some male friends that got kicked out because they fucked up and they fucked up bad. Like they earned it. And they right. know it. Right. They own it. They're like, yeah, that, yeah. you know, I may, I met some dope people, but I fucked up, whatever. But like, it's just interesting. The. Uh, how a lot of like hindsight is 2020, but what's clear about it for a lot of people is they're like, fuck that place. So it's just right. it's good to hear that. Like there are still a lot of people out there. There are people out there that are like, Hey, no, this like, yeah, it was tough. Yeah. I got yelled at by a 15 year old. Yeah. You know, there's some real stupidity going on, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it set a foundation for my life. That's carried me to where I'm at now. So right. is, is NIMI where you decided like, Hey, I'm going to go into law enforcement. I'm going to go into m the military. Like that's where you kind of decided that. You know, it is. Um, the military is something that I've thought about joining ever since I was younger and kind of looking at high school. Um, I had a couple college offers. Uh, I had a couple dual college offers to play baseball and football at NAIA school in Nebraska and also up in Oregon. And then I had a couple of just, purely baseball offers throughout the country. But I had such a horrible experience with baseball my senior year of high school that I was like, you know, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do it. it. It pieces my nature. You know, I, I love the – being real, I love the recruitment. Everything, the uniform looks, like, sexy. Like, it just – everything about the Marine Corps just pulled me. And so, like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do it. Like, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Um, 
I got denied because I got my half sleeve done back in like, I think it was January of 2015. So I got denied from the Marine Corps because I couldn't cover with my hand. I tried actually joining the Marine Corps even while I was at NIMI and they still denied me. Like I, I was sold on joining them. Um, but what I think really switched the leaf for me, like completely just flipped over the leaf was when I looked at how the military environment, like you said, People absolutely hated it. Uh, I've always had the mentality of your focus dictates your reality, right? And a lot of the people that we come like converse with back from NIMI, they are always so focused on the really horrible aspects and the bad parts of NIMI. And some of those people, like you're calling out, had these just almost like life changing experiences that were for the worst. And by all means, I understand that those were horrible predicaments, and that is never okay. Not even the act like the school is okay for those. I had. I think five or six friends that I was really tight with that didn't even make it to the second year there because of whether it's grades or too many sticks, whatever, whatever the case may be, like they had their reasons, but most of them owned up to those. Um, but I looked at it in the sense of I could use this scenario right now and how much it sucks to further my mental discipline, to further my own abilities, which I guess that I was coming in there with very little and I can turn it into a success story where a lot of people see it as I could have done better. I feel like the, you talk about like a lot of the athletes that went to NIMI, it was always like, man, I should have came here. I should have went to yada, yada, yada. I could have gone to this school. I could have gone to this school. I could have gone to just the JUCO down the street from my house. And it would have been a lot easier. I could have focused on sports more. And I was always so, I always looked at it like, I could have done that, but I probably would have been far more invested in partying. I probably would have been way less disciplined when it came down my academics. I probably would not have cared like the taste of leadership that I got at NIMI. Uh, I was, I think already an XL after my, like right after we turned from rats to, was it privates or I don't, I don't new cadets. Yeah. I don't know how the rank structure worked, whatever it was. Yeah. I think about two months after is when I forgot my first officer position. Then I was on squadron staff as an XO for third squadron, my first semester, first class year. And then our squadron commander the last semester and being able to step into each one of those leadership roles and see how I could take something from that school and apply it to my own personal life. And it could lead to success down the road. It's almost like how much do I want to put into this to make it successful? Not just for myself, but for, my, uh, for others. Uh, and being able to just get that taste of leadership. When, when we talk about NIMI, like I'm talking about all these scenarios that were good, but it's because I look back on them. I reflect on them and I also reflect on how poor my character was during some of those. Uh, but I also remember those times where I'm just with my boys doing some, you know, stupid stuff in one of the barracks rooms. And those were great memories where, <laughs> you know, when I used to try to like sneak around with the TLAs were still searching rooms so I could run out and go, you know, this, that was Nimi, bro. Like that was the environment we had. Yeah. But I'm always, I've always lived it to where I never want to not enjoy what I'm doing. And if I'm in this scenario, I, I almost left after my first semester. I had talked to my family about it. I started reaching out to the schools. But I think having my family, kind of like what you're talking about, it, it takes the tribe to really lead you through. And talking to some people with some experience, man, they, they really were like, look, you're doing well there. Uh, the school is going to help you out. My grandfather, who's pretty much my, my father figure, right, who's, man, he has such an implication on my life who he was so proud of everything I was doing and he bragged about it to all of his family and his friends and just seeing stuff like that and how proud it made my family made me reflect that you know everything here ain't that bad and if I'm not in one of these scenarios where I'm having these life-changing events I can make it better than you know the average person or the people that are just here right next to me but just don't like it because it could be somewhere else so no I agree and I really do believe that you're going to end up having those experiences one way or another. And right. I think the sooner you have them and the, well, I think it's the sooner you can have them while it's, while you're able to absorb it, while you're able to actually understand what's going on. Um, at mm. least a little bit, because a lot of it is reflection. Um, I'm still learning a bit from my experience there. And one right. thing that I've kind of come to realize uh, certainly 
over the last year and a half since I've found myself um, in my professional world being in management, senior management positions at the companies that I work at. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I made a lot of really astoundingly stupid decisions while I was at that school, like leadership wise, don't get me wrong, like personally and stuff like that. And disciplinary wise, I made some stupid ass decisions too, but we on did yeah. yeah, but you know, Nimi for better or worse, you know, it's in a bubble. Like it's all its own world. It's unless you yep. do some really fucked up shit where some cops get involved. Like you're in your own world. You're in your own little sphere where, Unless you get kicked out of the school, all the disciplinary stuff is handled in house. Um, all right. the way going up to you know sexual stuff, going up to wheat or like drugs, alcohol, all that shit. You know, all mm -hmm. that is taken care of in house. And on the leadership side of that, you know, it's so strange. Like, it's so strange to me looking back on it and thinking like, you're, you know, you're putting. 17 18 year olds potentially in charge of up to 100 people you're putting right. 19 or 20 year olds in charge of over a thousand that's crazy mm -hmm. like that's yeah. that's that's actually crazy and then unless you don't like and and obviously as you know from experience some of the adult supervisors aren't the best and so unless right. you don't have solid supervision you know controlling the the rat race it's it can turn a little catastrophic and i made you know there's a couple of things that i did that i'm proud of and there's a couple of things that i did that i can look back on and be like i'm shocked that worked out but mm -hmm. there's a lot of other things that i look at back then lastly especially in my last three years there um just stupid decisions that i made stupid things that i said in public out loud to people that i was in charge of quote unquote and yeah. I was like, wow, like, you know what? Like the way I was like, damn, that's stupid. But at the end of the day, I look at it and I was like, okay, that, all of that was in me. And that was going to come out at some point. Now, right. am I going to let that all come out again where it's a controlled environment? I'm young. It's a bubble. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things, you know, I certainly got disciplined for it, but you know, it's all in its own bubble. Like you're not really going to have lasting impact on a whole lot of things other than yourself. So are you either going to do sure. it there or are you going to do it in a, in a real work environment in a real, right. you know, civilian or, you know, military, if you're going the military side, if you're going to go into an environment where it's not controlled, where it's very much, you know, you can get fired, you can get demoted and then it affects your paycheck. It affects the way you pay rent. Right. It affects the way you pay right. your car bill. Like, you know, if there's like actual, um, there's actual, uh, consequences. What the fuck? Why is it telling me we're running out of time? Okay. If it cuts us off, we'll just reconnect. That's dumb. I've never okay. ran into that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fuck them. All right. So, so yeah, anyway, I just, I look back on that and I wonder if you have these, these experiences too, where. You know, you recognize some of the stupidity you did, but you're glad you did that at a young age. Do you ever like feel yourself looking no. back at that? Right, I do. Um, I actually want to, before we even get to that subject, there's one thing I want to remember. You were actually the very first person who I got a letter of recommendation for for my promotion. So I remember it's like, <laughs> do you have any letters of rec? I remember, bro, I don't even think you knew me. I, I was just like, hey, CSM, like, think you would be able to write me a rec? I'm trying to go for XO for, I think it was golf. No, I and remember you, you were in like, one of yeah, my Crim sure. J awesome. classes. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, we were. Yeah. And so I think like I, when I look back to what I could experience um, with my interaction with you was we weren't we weren't boys. We weren't tight. We had a class together. But what I noticed was you had so much time and I would pretty much call it an investment in that school as your time in that leadership role. You made it real when I showed up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we showed up there, the expectation you had of your NCOs and you know the people that were delegated underneath you was to be able to almost you know hold the traditions a little bit or whatever, but also kind of I think what I remember the most was train the standard rather than train the time. That was something I remember you saying, yeah. and that was just things that like I could tell you was the interaction between us was always just cadet to cadet rather than friend to friend. 
and stuff like that, man. That was that was implications that you probably didn't know you had on people, but was was real moments that changed my ability to step into leadership when my time came. And um, but then I look back on kind of like, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, right, you just threw me off. So go ahead, bro. <laughs> oh, sorry, man. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, you No, it's you know, and I, I appreciate I appreciate all that. I really do. Um, but again, you know, it doesn't. None of that was organic. It was very learned. And that's one of the things that I learned super early at that place was, you know, in theory. And obviously as you step into the civilian world, you learn this is not true some of the time, but in theory, the people that are in positions above you are there for a reason. And it can normally be in your best interest to learn from those people. And even, you know, right. at, at that school, you know, you, you would find that some of the people above you were there for less than um, holistic reasons. But right. in, in time, you, as you gain the, not only just the knowledge of your environment, the knowledge of where you're at and who you're talking to, you end up finding yourself thinking, okay, this is the type of person that I need to model myself after. This person is only doing what they're doing because they get the benefits. This person doesn't give a fuck, but at least they're honest. So I'm going to take a little bit from that person. Right. And, you know, because you can learn. Right. And, you, and you, I learned that social skill anyway from being at that place, not only for so long, but starting out there at fucking 14 years old. That's a weird place to grow up in. It's a weird yeah. place to grow up in. <laughs> I could imagine, brother. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't imagine going to high school. I really couldn't. I, I, I could not comprehend like thinking about how my freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year went and having to do that in a mini environment, bro. I, I, I give kudos to anyone that went to high school there because I don't think I could do it. <laughs> so, that's, that's just absurd. Yeah, it was it was wild, man. But so from going going from that place and learning what you had learned, where did you go next? Like what what was your next step after that? Um I, I completely forgot to answer your previous question. I'm so sorry. So your previous question was, do I ever reflect on the lessons that I learned there? Oh, and yeah. did I, you know, I, I never answered that. And I'm, I just remembered I didn't. But yes, I do. Uh, I remember looking back on times like that, like I had a, I had a, not a soldier, a, a cadet who was going through like family problems. And I had to find a way to almost like adjust how I'm leading him because you know I, we were doing ami at like 10 o'clock at night and i was literally having him roll the dirt in the box not the dirt but the grass and he was okay with that because he was like man i don't get this time with my dad my dad didn't want to spend time with like this me so my leadership you know you caring about me is more than i ever got from them and you know i took back moments like that i'm like you know i'm, I'm 17 18 years old at the time trying to figure out how to be an effective leader for a kid who's just looking for a father figure I don't know a lot of freshmen in high school or sophomores in high school have to go through those kind of experiences in a school environment. You know, sometimes it happens outside of there, but in the school environment, having to adjust that. um, I, I look back all the time on how I had to learn like simple things like leaders eat last, stuff like that, that was just taught, you know, doctrinated things that have reflected into my day to day life that affected when I went to the army, all of that stuff. So, yeah, man, I, I definitely look back and I'm so thankful that I experienced what I experienced there because it set me apart as the years have gone on. Uh, to answer your next question, what did I do once I graduated from NIMI? Uh, so I actually got in contact with a, I was working, I was the, an intern at the International Law Enforcement Academy there in Roswell. I'm sure Catherine talked about it in class as well. And I met, you know, someone who was working in investigations there He's like, hey, man, if you're ever interested in working, you know, in this career field, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. I would love to show you around our facilities, love to introduce you to what we do out here. And I was like, OK, I mean, this is a better option than just going back to Arizona and working security at a casino because that's what I was doing during the summers. <laughs> so I was like, OK, yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll take a trip out there and see what's up. I go out there, I go out here. And man, it's a culture shock, like the East Coast, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And Phoenix, Arizona are two totally different worlds, just different. (laughs) And so I'm just, I'm here and I'm just like looking around like, yo, this is, this is normal. Like this is how it, this is how it is out here. And, you know, he pretty much walks me the ropes. I'm meeting some high wigs and 
pretty much like, yo, this is, this is something I can see myself doing. I was about to actually start school at the University of Maryland for a criminal justice degree. And I was talking to their ROTC department because I wanted to become an army officer. And they pretty much told me, like I mentioned before, my high school grades just were not going to cut it. My NIMI GPA was okay. But their schools, I guess, extremely selective. I think it's like three, six plus, and I'm not that great of a student, man. Um, and so I was like, how am I going to do this? So I was like, okay, what I'll do is I'll enlist in the Army. I'll, I'll join the Maryland Guard. Um, I'll get enough money to be able to fund me moving out here. I'll take online classes for a semester, boost my GPA, and then try again to get into the school. And so, you know, I joined, become 31 Bravo, basically training at Fort Leonard Wood. Met some of the best friends of my life I've ever had. My actual, the roommate I have now, I went to basic training with. How crazy how that works, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, like it's it's cool, bro. I went. I just got back from BLC a couple of months ago, and I had to do that with the basic training with there. Uh, we still have a group chat on Snapchat that we talk at least I'd say once a weekend. Like I'm I'm, I'm tight with the people I went to basic with, uh, and I'm so thankful for that. But man, I I move out to Maryland after basic, and I'm actually living in the apartment of a. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with John Jennings. I don't know if you remember the name. You went to Nini. That sounds um, his super parents were, familiar. My boy, man, just great. He's a great officer. He he was in the ROTC department. Um, we went to Norwich after. Oh yeah. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I know he's yeah. about. But yeah. it's my 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 brother, man. But he uh he was so man. He literally asked his family if I could like stay in their basement, and I was sleeping in their basement for like three or four months, trying to get like my feet on the ground, man. I was. I was, I'm going to tell you, bro, that was probably one of the, one of the hardest moments in my life because I had just moved cross country. I knew nobody. Um, I hadn't even drilled with the unit yet. I was like, my life consisted of waking up, you know, getting some food, try to find some food because my, my bank account was kind of hurting around that time because I just kept going through it. Uh, I'd go to the gym. And when I went to the gym, you know, I do my strength training. I wouldn't talk about lifetime fitness at the time. And I do my strength training and then I go play basketball for a couple of hours. And then I go to the sauna and then go to the swimming pool. I was at the gym for like seven hours a day because it was like I had nothing else to do. I, I didn't, I'd go back home, play video games, go to sleep. I was repeat. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, you know, I got to get a job. So then I became uh, an assistant manager at a lids in the mall. And then I got on some army orders and we'll, we'll get to that part, but. Okay. So you were talking about, he moved into Jennings place and him and his parents, they gave you uh, the basement to crash in for a couple months. So before we move on to like where you got a job at and where you're reapplying to the school, you Mm -hmm. know, a lot of, I think that's one of the most important times. Not that I've been on the, on the earth long at all, but I feel like that time in your life when you're in that traditional period where, you know, whether you're couch surfing, whether you're staying with somebody, you know, for a period of time, no matter what you're doing, when you feel that you're in that traditional period in your life, you know, a lot of people just get complacent with it. They're like, you know what? I'm not paying a whole lot of money for rent, sharing the food bills, sharing the electric bills. You know, I've got a roof. I've got a place to sleep. I'm getting laid sometimes. I mean, life ain't too bad. You know, why uh, <laughs> Why do I need to change right now? But, like, obviously you didn't get complacent with that. So what was that yeah, mindset? Right. Was that mindset in your head? Like, I got to, like, I'm happy with what I have. I'm happy my friend and his family <laughs> gave me what they've given me, but this is not permanent, and I need to make something happen. So what? Like, what was your mindset in that transitional period? It was in my, I was looking at it this, in the sense of they were so gracious to give me that, but I never expect for them to think that I'm going to live there for the next year or two. And so my mentality was, is I'm never going to overstay a welcome. So they're letting me hear that now they're, they're supplying and helping me out as much as they can. But at the end of the day, if I continue to just sit there and get comfortable with it, it's almost like, yo, like we're not adopting you. We're just <laughs> you're, you're, you're here for a moment. Get, get on your feet and go. But I also look in the sense of like going to NIMI, you know, that was two years that I didn't get to spend a lot of time with my family. And then making the commitment to go to Maryland for what we're now here for almost six years now, I think, or five years. 
uh, I look at it in the sense of that's a big commitment to make to leave the people that I love and that I care about. And I feel that I would be doing a disservice, not just to my family, but to myself to leave my friends and my family to go do this thing and then get there, get complacent with it and just start being stagnant because it's like, oh yeah, just cause I'm comfortable, I'm ready to give up or I'm, I'm cool with being where I'm at right now. Nah, I, I, I saw it with, I gotta get to work. Um, and I also look at it in the sense of kind of how fitness got involved with everything was, well, I went to basic training, man. Um, I took like four or five months before I went to basic and I didn't train at all. I didn't prepare to go to basic. I was just kind of like, I'll figure it out when I get there. Like, that's what I'm supposed to be going there for, right? And so my last, <laughs> my last, my last taste of, uh, you know, when I was really training was when I was with, like the Grindhouse program at NIMI, where we were in the weight training program and doing slab runs and all that crazy stuff. And so then, you know, when I started thinking about getting ready to go to basic, like, I remember it was like the week before and I looked in the mirror, I was like, Damn. like boy you about to, you about to go through it man. and so i go it's red <laughs> man it's red phase bro i'm getting smoked i'm getting just i'm, I'm out of it they were calling me tub tub I was, like, I, was, I was going through it bro <laughs> yeah i was like oh i think i lost when i was in basic i lost like 35 pounds or something like that but what i recognized when i was there was i never wanted to allow my physical fitness to determine whether or not myself or someone else lives if we ever get in those scenarios, right? Being there, I was like, okay, I was lazy with my prepping to get here. And due to that, I'm reaping the repercussions. Every action has a reaction, right? And if I was to think that way to where I didn't care about training and God forbid, you know, we go to World War III or whatever the case may be, I don't want it to be to where I can't, carry the guy that just got shot out of you know the firefight because I haven't physically put myself in any scenarios to where I've trained and haven't worked with that load before. And so then once I got to Maryland and I'm in this, you know, my self time, I guess, when I'm just living in that basement, I heavily focused on trying to step into that next level of physical fitness. Because if I want to go to aerosol school, if I want to go to ranger school, anything like that, I wanted to be physically ready to go. Am I always ready for that? Man, Lord knows I got, I got my <laughs> moments, but I, I definitely work hard for that. And so that's paid also into the same mentality of getting out of that, that I guess, comfortable environment. I was never comfortable there. I, I was thankful, but I was never comfortable. And so I just continued to work through, I think, like I said, about three months before I moved on to future endeavors. But uh, yeah, man, it was, it, was, it was an interesting time for sure. No, and like I said, man, like you, I think you took that time in stride, and I think you made the most of it. I mean, clearly you've, right. you know, you're still going. Like you've still you moved out, you kept moving forward. So, like, what did that look like moving out of, out of that traditional period into something a little more stable, or did it not get more stable? Like, what did that look like afterwards? So, I got on orders. I don't know if you're. I'm sure you're familiar with the Comet, like a Comet inspection. Uh, I think so. I'm sure you to do yeah. this so it's pretty much a change of command when they re-inventory everything that an armory has right and so i was like okay yeah i need the money i'll sign up for this and it was like a couple of months it was good money but brother it was the most like tedious but yet not rewarding job i have ever done in the military uh i was sitting there man and just like counting mvgs and how many you know mre boxes do we have and writing it all down putting it on the floor so it can get inspected and uh you know, I was making good money doing it, but I hated what I was doing. Um, but doing that, I kind of just jumped on a, I was taking it in stride and I got an apartment. Knowing that I had just started making pretty decent money, I got an apartment closer to the armory. Um, I actually was lucky enough to get a roommate who became my gym partner and everything like that too. And that helped me financially. And so, uh, you know, I got into a much better space just because I was willing to take that leap, even though if I was... I guess if you to say if I was look at it smart, it wasn't, it wasn't a smart idea to get my own apartment yet. I could have saved more money and they've been able to get something nicer. But like I said, I just, I knew that it, kind of what you're talking about, I would have got stagnant if I would have stayed there. I would have got very comfortable with it and I didn't want to get there. So I moved on to the apartment and I had to start figuring stuff out all over again. And so 
uh, once I got into that scenario, I actually got an, an offering with the Maryland National Guard. It's called a counter drug program. And they attach you to, you know, entities for investigations, right? And I got hired on with them. And I ended up working for the exact same group and in the same exact building that I had originally moved out to Maryland to work for from a completely different avenue. So, like, I thought I was going to go this way. And, you know, I took a hard right and still found my way to work for exactly who I thought I was going to. So it's like one of those things to where it's, you can either look at it in luck to where I just so happened to stumble upon it. But I also know that through that time and I was spiritually in my bag in the sense of where I was really trying to seek out answers as to what was next. And, you know, I felt where I'd move and when I moved, I did. And it put me right where I wanted to be. So. No, and that's, yeah, you know, the, I sound like a fucking hippie, but you know, <laughs> the, the universe has a way of working that out where, right. you know, if you really normally anyway, if you really are going after something and you're fit for it and, you know, eventually if you work at something hard enough and work at it well enough, you'll get good at it. You'll finally become yeah. more or less not shitty at it and eventually one day right. you'll be per- yeah eventually you'll be proficient hopefully hopefully you'll be proficient and you continue that momentum and you know yep. it sounds like that's the track that you found yourself on and almost i would say like it's probably a good thing that you didn't get set on the course you thought you were going to because that was the course you were prepared for you know, right. I think I think you learn more when you are set on a path that you're not prepared for when you're set on a path where, you know, you have no idea what the next day is going to bring you. But there's still a level of confidence that you can still achieve that, that you can still get through right. it, that you can still, you know, have the initiative in you, but also get an, at least get enough self-confidence to say, yeah, I can handle this, you know, right. Um, and you brought this up uh, a couple times on how important physical fitness has become to you. What you, and you've touched on it as we've talked about where you started and going through NIMI and all that, going through athletics, going through baseball, right. what was, what has been your mindset going to training? Cause it sounds like a, it's been a base, excuse me, it's been a base of functional strength, but mm-hmm. you know, there's also like basically wait, wait, what's your mindset going towards it? So what I try to maintain is I try to maintain where in, in my mindset is I want to be as if someone was to step into a room, right. And I was to have the strongest guy in the gym and I was to have like the most calisthenic fast guy in the gym and they were both to be right there. Would I be able to hang with both of them? Not be either one of them, but would I be able to hang with both of them? Could I step in and, like go compete in a thousand pound club at any moment. Yes. Could I go and run two to five miles? Yes. Do I, can I do it great? No, but I can do it. Right. So it's kind of to where it's like, I've always wanted to be to where whenever a scenario is presented, I'm not too far out of training for whatever that scenario is. My body is naturally like I can, I can carry weight. I've always been strong, but I haven't always been, you know, cardiovascular and calisthenic based. That's just, it's not a strong suit of mine. So I try to add that into my programs and try to continue doing that. But I also don't want to lose what my natural strength is. Does that make sense? No. It's perfect, so yeah. I look at, I look at it in the sense of like, I have hypertrophy or hypertrophy, however people say it. Everyone says it differently. I have that into my programs. I have to where I'm really still working on power cleans and hang cleans in my programs. I have to where I'm working on, you, you know, your big three, your squat, dead, uh, deadlift and bench throughout my programs. I normally switch out every three to four months to kind of allow myself to constantly be switching it up, but growing in each direction. So that, like I said, if I was to find out that, Hey, we're going to send you to some army school in two months, would you be able to go? I'm at a baseline to where in those two months, putting together a program to work off of that, I can go and I'll be successful. But also if I want to try to get jacked over the winter and I don't have anything military side coming up, can I go put on 15 pounds of muscle and try to up my numbers with my power lifting. Yeah, I can go do that as well. So that that's kind of where my focus is. And it's 
like I don't think I don't think I've ever looked at it in the eyes of like general fitness. So it's just like, oh, I just want to look good and you know da 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 da. That's actually like being real. It's never been my main focus as to why I train. I've, I've I want to look good. I don't think anybody does it. I want to show and see what I'm doing, but I far I focus far more on you know being able to maintain and have that functionality. Yeah, right. yeah. and still be able to be okay, man. It's just I don't. I have I have friends that are hella strong, like stupid strong. My boy Ben Avery, he went to NIMI actually. He was my roommate. Yeah, I remember and him. This was like the strongest guy. He's like the strongest guy I've ever met. Like this dude was like effortlessly in the fifteen hundred pounds club, bro. Just just effortless. Yeah. Tank built then, like an absolute tank. brick. Yeah, bro, he was a he was a ninja turtle, bro. He had the shell and everything, <laughs> my guy. Like he was just a big body. He was just built different. And then, like, hey, bro. I was, I moved in. I remember the first day, bro, I stepped into that room and I see him in there. I'm like, yo, bro, I'm going to start having my water bottles missing. Like, all of a sudden, all my stuff's going to be gone, bro. He's going to just take what he wants because he's a big dude like that. But no, bro, he's a great guy. He's one of my best friends to this day. Um, and so I have friends like that that are just built different. I got friends that are trying to aspire to get their physical goals or their fitness goals. And so that's what kind of got me to get my NASM. I got my NASM uh, certification. And so I'm actually a trainer at Powerhouse Gym in, in uh, Maryland. And it's allowed me to be able to work with people with different goals, um, coming from different injuries, coming from you know, different athletic backgrounds, and be able to give them a solid product because of the idea I've bounced and put my, you know, dabbled in each one of these different realms of physical fitness. So do I think that I'm the guy yet? No, I don't. Do I think that when I walk into the gym, I'm the strongest guy there? No, I don't. Um, do I think that I'm top tier? No, I don't even think that. But I, what I do know is that I work hard for it. And when I want to set my mind to that, I'm going to be that. It's just a matter of trying to find that balance, man. I, I, I see so many times with people that they sell out in something and they completely neglect other parts of their life. And so I see those guys that will completely fall out in the gym and go crazy but then you know different supplementation with different you know gear we we'll use gear uh could affect and they go to where the gym is where their thought process is and where their heart is at all times and that has been a coping mechanism for some points or you know something they dived in at a really hard point in their life but i never wanted to be to where i only go to the gym because you know i fight my demons or, you know, I'm going to the gym because I want to look better than my friends, because I feel like that's all very superficial and cover ups for an issue you're truly having deep down. And so that's kind of where I have that mentality is, is love it because I love it, love it because it's fun, love it because I get to make friends out of it and enjoy time with people, but never allow it to rule my life, if that makes sense. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. Um, and I definitely want to get into that and another thing you just brought up. But what's interesting to me is you you've actually put yourself through courses. You've went and got your certification. You've actually, you know, formally educated yourself. Mm -hmm. So you look at your mindset. You have your mindset now, and you look at how you either you viewed fitness, you approached it yourself, you talked about it to other people. How did that change before and after you started actually becoming formally educated about it? Like, how did that change? It changed recognizing that everyone didn't come from the same background I went to, right? So in high school, I went to, like, the West Side powerhouse um, in Arizona of football, right? So our strength training program there was outstanding. I remember as a freshman in soft, well, freshman in high school, I was already being walked through, like, powerlifting progressions when it comes to your power clean and your hand clean and the deadlift, how to properly do it with form. And we never even put weight on the bar yet. It was all focused on just how to do it properly. And I saw great numbers when I was in high school. Like when I was a junior in high school, I was already squatting over three plates. I was power cleaning. I think 275 is the most I ever did. Um, I, I was good. Like, I was moving weight, bro. I was moving Christ. good weight there. But at Centennial, bro, the high school I was at, that, that was normal. Like the athletes there were just normally that good. We had a dude, bro, that broke all of the school's records, like his sophomore year of high school. And then just like was okay with that and just stopped. And it's just that programs like that set you apart in the long run because I understood the implications of having a very, very strict regimen with trying to make sure form was good. 
right? So I came to the board with when I started training people. Well, I wouldn't say training. When I started working out with people prior to getting certified, it was all about like, okay, I'm going to see where you're at. We're going to see what your max is. We're going to watch your form. And then we'll make adjustments. And then we'll max out again in seven, eight weeks. And we'll see what's changed. And when you're working out with someone who's either there for general fitness or who has been in the weight room maybe five times in their life, you can't do that. You can't, you can't try to overload them on a squat and expect for them to be able to succeed and then be able to adjust all those form things. Because now, the, the, now back in, in the back of their mind, they're looking at it like, if this is how I'm going to feel, if, if I'm going to get to failure like this and my legs are all shaking and I look like my form is bad, I felt that my form was bad. You know, it has a direct impact on their mentality why they're training. And noticing that I've had to had to change how I, you know, pretty much come to people in the sense of rather than trying to get a baseline of how strong you are, let's let's build that baseline from what I know, really focus in on our form, kind of go through the same progressions that I talked about uh, and let, let's get you to where you want to be rather than, you know, adjusting to where you currently are, if that makes sense. And then also looking at it, man how I to day to this day still have to really focus on nutrition because you know you got those people that could go eat a double cheeseburger with fries and a soda every day and they just maintain it they they okay everything's good brother I look if I look at a honey bun I just look at one that's, that's 15 <laughs> that's, that's about a pound that's a pound of pound or two bro like I can't I can't even I can't even I can't even just look at it or it's like man here we go I step on a scale. Ah, man. So it's like I have to focus so heavily there to see such a minor result. And through that is kind of like we're talking about like that hyper focus and that dedication to where like I have to want it and work at it harder than the next person because I can't just skate by eating whatever I want. I can't do that. I have to I have to put in that extra effort to be able to see just a minor increase in my physique or a minor increase in my strength or my general wellness. So yeah, man, it's it's a it's a progress. It's just progress constantly. Well, and that that's a good approach that you have, where it's like, because a lot of people when they go to the gym, you know, all they know is what they see on. Well, now it's not even YouTube anymore; it's Instagram what they see. Yeah, and TikTok. In TikTok for sure, and I just remember when I was in middle school, when I was in high school, you know, because when I was a kid, my dad introduced me to the gym when I was real young. And mm -hmm. he, and in the worst possible way, I fucking hated going to the gym. He was dragging me to the gym when I was fucking five or six years old, and I fucking hated it. So I was like, "What am I gonna do here? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be here." I was never that dude that was interested, or that kid that was interested in it. So literally, I would fucking sit there with a stack of Batman comics on the fucking bike, pedal that bitch enough to where it can stay in motion, and just fucking read comics all day. But yeah. then. But, you know, I, I go through middle school and I start kind of getting into it more, admittedly, through fucking action movies. Like, I was just consumed with all the fucking Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Van Damme, and you know, all those movies from the 80s and the 90s. Like, yo, these guys are, like, living superheroes. How the fuck are they this big? And, right. and you know, then going right. to high school at NIMI, you know, yeah, I'm with my friends that are just a bunch of, you know, pubescent high schoolers trying to figure out what's going on. But we're looking at... The college kids, the athletes, we're looking at actual athletes, yeah. and it's like, what's he doing? You know, what are they doing? And what water are they drinking, man? Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are not drinking the Roswell water. What the fuck? But no. um, but you know, <laughs> uh, our approach to it was always how how much can you deadlift how much can you bench how much can you squat and of course because we're young stupid kids how much can you curl stupid but that's what like mm. that's yeah. what was that was what was important to us and in that mm -hmm. mindset you know you sacrifice form like i know for a fact yeah. i know for a fact that's why i have fucked up knees is because i was a dumbass squatting two and a half plates as a junior in high school when I damn well couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't like, cause I remember I really started giving a shit about lifting weights when I was a sophomore, the back half of my sophomore mm -hmm. year. And I was like on it 
And I forget, I forget who the college dude was. He was in my troop at NIMI. And I remember we were just having a conversation about it because he was pretty built. And he was like, yo, think about it like this. For the most, if you're going to keep going to high school here, you're going to spend more than half of your calendar year at a place where you have free food, a free gym, and you can sleep for seven to six hours a day. That's all mm-hmm. you need. And I was like, yeah, he's got a point. So I just got super into it. I carried it through that summer after my sophomore year of high school. And then I got back junior year and, uh, you know, I just got carried away with it because I just saw all these people use so much weight, fucked up myself. But, you know, my point in telling all this is, you know, the mindset when you get into fitness, the mindset when you're going into training is so important. And, you know, it's like, yeah, it's almost like becoming, you know, on Instagram, you see all the, whether it's memes or whether it's like motivational, whatever, where it's like, yeah, you're there to fight your demons. You're there because she left you. You're there because, well, yeah, 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 dude. Like, yeah, I mean, I'd be lying if I said that weightlifting didn't help with my mental or didn't help me with like day-to-day stresses. Like, sure, sure. awesome. But like, that's not long. You don't want that to be long-term. You want a mental mm-hmm. illness to be like with you permanently just so you can lift weights? Right. No, bro. That's not cool. Like, it's not cool. And, you know, you want to find the reason why you're going, whether it's because, like you said, you know, you want to be able to be versatile. You want to be able to be, or some people just want to be the strong man. They look up to people like Eddie Hall and, mm-hmm. um, oh, what's his name? The fucking mountain from Game of Thrones. I forget his name. But, uh, you know, you, you, they're looking up to those people or, um, you know, like me, like I grew up watching like fucking Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno and Frank Zane, you know, you look up to those people, mm-hmm. you know, whatever type of fitness you kind of want to get into, you know, whatever lifestyle you want to live, the lifestyle is going to carry you. That's what matters. Right. And so do you find that like, cause like me personally, I got off of TikTok a while back. Because that shit is a fucking cancer. And right. one of the last things that I saw, and we can get into this topic a little bit later, but one of the last trends that I saw really popping up were these young, young kids. Like 18, 19. I'm sure they were under 18, a few of them. But 18, 19, 20. They're in the gym for six months. They're in the gym for the year. They've got their beginner gains going on. And they're like, you know what? I'm going to hop on trend. Like that's... Yeah, I- that's scary. So like before we get into the conversation about gear and all that craziness, but like, do you find that as you've become a trainer, as you've been helping people out, I mean, and you promote your own stuff on social media. Like I see it and I fucking commend you for it. Yeah. You know, you're, you're promoting like, Hey, I'm, I've gotten this certification. I've started this. I'm starting this brand. I'm, you know, I want to yeah. be able to help people with personal training. I want to help you get you to your goals. Do you find mm-hmm. people, whether they're reaching out to you, whether they're actually people you work with in your gym that you're employed at, where they approach mm-hmm. you through the mindset of, you know, I'm so influenced by social media. I've picked up a lot of these ideas. I've picked up a lot of these mindsets from social media. Do you find that prevalent in any way, shape or form? I do. And, you know, I think the the primary, like I don't have TikTok either. And what I look at is, you know, I'll get like an Instagram reel or something like that that's sent to me. And you're looking at this, you know, 16, 17 year old with a crazy physique. And, you know, let's say, you know, we're, let's call you just an average 21 year old dude. You just got out of, you know, maybe you're in school still, whatever. And you're looking at this dude that's five, six years younger than you. And he looks like he could step on a stage right now for, you know, go up there for whatever class he decides to. He could go put on weight if he wanted to. And it's, it's demoralizing for, I would say, the average person to look at how gear, I mean, we're pretty much going to call it gear. Because a lot of these kids, man, you'll, you'll see a video that they'll post and then they'll talk about like, here was me seven months ago, here's me now. Yes, you are young and you are going to see some crazy transformations between that time frame. But then you'll start seeing they'll talk about how, oh yeah, I had to go jump on, you know, HRT or something like that because I had crash test levels. How do you have crash test levels at 16, 17 years old, but you're maintaining this physique right now? Right. It's one thing if you're just like, I, I know that test levels don't have a direct implication on your ability to gain and maintain muscle. Right. It has a, it has a, 
I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to tap into my more plates, more dates there right here, man. But <laughs> you know, I'm trying to <laughs> I don't wanna I don't wanna start saying stuff that's not true, but I'm also going based off of what I'm 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 learning is that you can have crash test levels and still be able to maintain and gain strength and muscle and weight. That is completely possible. But when you're 16 years old at a no 0.8% body fat, sitting at 185 pounds and you're you're juicy, right? You are out of prime physique with crash test levels, you think you expect me to believe that that was naturally occurring? Like I just, I don't, I don't, I don't see that as a, as a, a normal thing. I mean, I see guys in the gym all the time working at a gyms that I train at. You see these guys that are on the gear, and how hard they're able to train is is wild to me. It's like these guys can go in there day in day out and move weight. And they can go, and depending on obviously what they're on, because we can talk about trends, we can talk about different tests, we can talk about Anavar, we can talk about all these other things that people could be taking, how it could affect you in different ways. And obviously you're accepting like how well you can recept, uh, receive um, enhancers, if we're going to call them that. It's just crazy to me, man, how social media has such an implication on people's view of fitness. Because I even look at it in the sense of, right, how many times could you scroll on social media and you see people talking about how they want to have those fitness goals in the gym and it's two people posing next to them, a boy and a girl that are at these younger ages and like, that's what I want, that's who I want to be. How, how, how is it possible, how is it possible to where you can look at this constantly, these, these sources that aren't even from your lifestyle and you want to be in these shoes so bad that it starts impl- – like, like I said, your, your focus dictates your reality. If you're constantly looking at these things. You're constantly looking at TikTok. And you're constantly looking at this for either different training habits, different dietaries. I, I just – I had to cut out that. I had to. I had to stop looking at it because it, it does affect how I was able to look at myself in the mirror. It affected how I was able to eat and just very firm against it. And I'm also like – I would be lying. I would be lying to you if I ever said I didn't think about it. Yeah, what if I was to jump on gear? What if I was to jump on something? How, how crazy would I look? How strong could I be? We talk about like, that once a week, we had bro. this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we talk about it almost every week. Like, it's like, man, if I was, a, if I was to do this, you know, it'd probably be kind of crazy. But I also recognize that if I was to do it, what am I doing it for? Because I don't want to go stand on the stage. I don't want to. I don't want to compete. I don't want to post on social media about my physique. Like I don't really care about that. So I would be taking this for higher. That's not why I train in the first place. That's it gets so. It's tough, man. It's tough how envy envy can drastically change kids' lives just because they're seeing someone else do it, or like the the love for speed bum right now. How it's like everybody want to look like Seba. Everybody want to train like Seba. It's well, I do too. I want to look like it. But <laughs> if it's gonna take if it's gonna take me doing things that are unnatural to me, I'm cheating myself, and I don't I don't need that. Well, you know, two things. The first thing is what's scary to me, aside from the obvious health implications, aside from the um the very negative side effects that will come to these younger kids, including people my, my age, that our age, that do stuff like Trin, D-Ball, Winstrol, Super Draw, you know, shit like that. You know, the health implications yeah. that will come to those people that are blasting that gear, you know, aside from all of that, what's worrying to me is the obvious lack of knowledge. Because I truly feel... Again, this is just my opinion, but I truly feel that if you knew what the real implications are, not that I do anywhere close, but just from what I know and my ignorance, if you knew what the implications of these drugs are, you Mm. wouldn't take them so young. You would not take them. So I'll be real. like, Like, unless you're trying to turn into a real competitor, which is a sub factor of, of the population of people in the gym let alone mm-hmm. just people in general, just people who go to the gym regularly. That is a 1% to 2% of people that want to do that. You know, you wouldn't do it. You just would not do it. 
And then the second thing, you know, you, you brought up Derek a little earlier. You know, I was actually listening to an episode of his two nights ago, and he brought up a really good point. Um, he goes, why would you want to take this so early on? Forget about maxing out your stuff as a natty. Forget about, you know, knowledge of the drugs. Your body, your organs can only take so much exposure to these compounds why do you want to waste those exposures when you're young? Right. Use that when you're, you know, inching up to 30, over 30, 35 years old, when your body's conditioned to this trauma, when it's conditioned to getting mm -hmm. beat up and torn down, built up, cut weight, all these, you know, this huge spectrum of fitness that is available to you while you're natural. Because one thing that I had to learn that has been taught to me by a couple of people, uh, one natural and literally two people, one natural, one not. Um, they both had the same thing to say just because of their knowledge. You know, when I had to hop on test and they were telling me, they're like, you know, yeah, you're going to gain muscle a little quicker. You're going to gain strength a little quicker, provided you nutrition properly and you eat properly. You're going to be able to do all these things. However, mm -hmm. just because of the way the human body works, your muscle is now going to outgrow your lint, your, uh, your, by not by a lot, but it, ha it now has the possibility to outgrow your tendons and your ligaments. And mm -hmm. if you have an injury in one of those things and your muscle outgrows it, forms around it, now you've got problems. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's such people think that like, oh, I'm just going to hop on gear. I'm just going to hop on steroids and I'm going to get jacked and built and life is going to be great. It's like, no, you have to have such a deep understanding of the human body, such a deep understanding of your own body that, mm -hmm. you know, to, to understand what could happen both positive and negatively. And you bring up someone like Chris Bumstead, like, yeah, everyone loves that guy. I love that guy. Mm -hmm. Are you fucking kidding me? He's, yeah. a, he's a god. And he's only 27. Right. Which, I which was is... literally, when, before we got on this call, I was scrolling. I saw pictures of him. I was just like, like man, <laughs> one day, bro. One day. Like, <laughs> crazy. But, but, but sorry, what's cr it, no, 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 no. It's, 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 the, it's a fact, you know? And my feet is flooded with him too. But, but, you know, I could... I could take his entire regimen from a natural when he was natural to when he switched into gear and whenever he and he starts carrying on this career enhanced. I could do the exact same thing and I am confident I will not look like him because he has a right. different body chemistry. He has a different makeup. He has different genetics. There are so many different ways that his body reacts to the compounds than mine ever will because there is only ever going to be one Ronnie Coleman. Like there is no right. way that anyone else is going to be able to replicate that extreme, like dehydrated cut, like shredded down physique. And then turn around three months later and squat 800 pounds. That's not happening. That is not happening. And then now we see the, unfortunately, we see the consequences of it. He walks around on crutches. His back mm -hmm. is completely fused together. You know, yeah. his, his knees, his artificial knees don't work because of just how his body works. It's unfortunate and it's sad, but you look at a guy like that in his heyday and, you know, that is 100% because of genetics. That is not mm -hmm. because, like, obviously the gear took him to new places and his body just happened to react properly right. to all the best gear just because that's just what happened with him. Right. But you look at guys, like, um, you know, not to, like, disparage, but there's a there's a video that Vice did. Um, I think it's called Juicing or it's called – I forget what it's called. But they're interviewing these guys – who are on steroids and sure they're very strong. And I, you see them pushing up good weight, whether it's on machines like plate loaded machines or it's on the free weight. But I know dudes that are natural that look better than that. 
right. just because yeah. so that's, that's just that's just how it works out. You know what I mean? And then, then like for me, like it's had like, and I'm and I'm not, you know, taking massive amounts of testosterone by any stretch of the imagination. I'm on fucking 200 milligrams a week, just so I can fucking okay. experience what a normal, um, uh, test range is. Because I don't. Because you bring up a good point where it's like you know, you start getting your test levels past a. Uh, super therapeutic range and you start getting through all these different side effects. I want nothing to do with that. I do not want exactly. to get above a thousand, 1100, uh, what's it called? Fucking nanograms per deciliter. I want mm -hmm. none of that. I want to sit between nine and 1100. I want to cruise. I want to know what it's like to fucking just have energy and fucking feel normal and, you know, just fucking live my life. And it's working out great right. so far. But I also know that now that I'm doing this, I have to take extra time out of my day to learn about what the side effects are, what they look like, what they feel like. And then yeah. how does, how does that, you know, how does, how could that potentially affect my life? So it's, mm -hmm. it's a wide range of things where we had left off, you know, yeah. in my opinion, the conversation surrounding gear, PEDs, you know, that conversation. And honestly, I think a lot of it is because of people like C-Bomb, where they're kind of bringing back the classic physique, bringing <laughs> back. Because a lot of people got turned off by, like, you know, the Jay Cutlers, Kai Greens, mm -hmm. Phil Heath, yeah. where these guys – like, yeah, they were ginormous. They were huge, but superhumans. They, they had that Palumboism going on, that turtle shell. And mm -hmm. that turned off a lot of people, which was granted. That was mostly because of the IGF one and because of the, the fucking insulin and all that. I understand that. But the common mm -hmm. person doesn't know that the common person goes steroids. And that's what makes them look the way they look. But right at least in my opinion, it's becoming a more open and okay conversation to talk about. Um, For sure. Do you feel that kind of in the same way? Because I'd imagine you have people talking to you about steroids in one way or another. For sure. And the, what I normally come to is I look at, like, how long have you been training? Oh, I've been training six months. I don't think it's okay at all. Because you haven't even developed, I would even call it a routine, but a baseline to see, hey, you know, I've been training for five years now and, you know, I can get my numbers up, but then they drop. I find I have to focus either on my physique or I have to focus on my strength. Like I can never really balance the two. It's really hard on me. You know, what should I do? Then conversations like that can be had because it's like, okay, you have naturally, you have, you've tried to reach the best your natural body can handle. And if that's something you truly want to do, then, you know, Lord knows by all means. And that's, that's, that's up to you. But the problem I'm having is I look at people and they start so early in their careers nowadays. It's like, man, you, you're still getting newbie gains and because it's not quick enough because you don't look like these guys that we're talking about, these classic physique guys, you know, you feel like you're not progressing quick enough. And you feel like, because if you get you know juicier, if you get more shredded, you get more jacked, it's going to have a better you know, your life is going to improve from it is almost, it's a, it's a false reality. You're, you're looking for something to, like I said we, earlier is you're looking for something to pretty much fix a problem you're having way deep, way deeper than what you're currently going through. You think it's a, a, an outside source and I don't think it is, but when I know we talk to people, I think our generation is plagued with sleep as being the nutrient. I, I call it a nutrient, but Sleep is what is keeping people from achieving these goals. So I think the amount of stimulants we have in our day-to-day -day basis, um, I mean, even for me, I, I don't know if it was the same for you, but I got NIMI. It was like, you do your studying, yada, 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 but then I'm going to bed at midnight and then I'd be up at six, right? So as a 17, 18 year old, you're already learning how to develop with six hours of sleep. And then you have those nights where you're maybe playing games with your friends or everyone's in your room just hanging out. Now it's four and a half hours. Um, you have the weekends when you just decide to watch movies. I remember, bro, I binge watched, I think, Spartacus. And I just like went through a whole weekend and just didn't sleep early. I was just watching shows 
like stuff like that happens. And then also you watch, you know, again, on social media, you see people post up about how like you only need four hours of sleep a night to be able to achieve your goals. The more time you're sleeping is less time you're working type things. Right. But if you have physical goals, like there's a reason we need sleep. That is where we are doing the most rebuilding. That's where our growth comes from. And that's also has a heavy impact on our mental capacity and our, our mental well-being. And so if we're so focused on stimulating our muscles, we're so focused on, you know, how, how am I supposed to eat? How am I supposed to train? How do I look like this? How do I look like that? But we're giving ourselves, I would see anything less than six hours of sleep regularly, regularly. Cause obviously like there's going to be days where you got to just grind. There's going to be nights where you're not going to get a lot of sleep. That is a part of being a young man or a young woman that you're going to have to go through to help allow, to allow you success in the future. That's a process. But if it is constant, you're, you're doing a disservice to yourself. And so I've learned that, I think, I think Derek actually says it before too, that like melatonin or I think it's ashwagandha, stuff like that is almost the most important supplement that you can take because if you can aid your sleep and recovery, you can train better. You're normally going to eat better. Your cognitive function throughout the day is better. And so that's what I really talk to with my clients is that if they're not being able to develop these good sleep habits, then all that other stuff needs to get pushed behind. You can figure that out. Once we get there, let's start talking about our proper training programs. Well, I'd say actually nutrition. Once we get to our nutrition, our sleep's good. Okay, now we can really focus on training. We've been training for two years now or something, and now you're starting to hit these plateaus. Okay, maybe we can have these other conversations. But it's these basic elements that we miss in our day-to-day -day lifestyle that are implicate are pretty much either holding you back or, if you're doing them right, are going to help further you in the direction that you want to go. No, that's that's a good point. And, you know, I we grew up in the same generation, like you said, where it's like you need to keep working. You can only do or you can work on four hours, five hours of sleep, all this stuff. And I forget mm -hmm. who said it, but they said, you know, if sleep wasn't so ingrained and it wasn't such a, bo a bodily function of being a human, if you could put sleep mm -hmm. in a pill – sleep in a syringe sleep would be a um a banned substance because of how mm -hmm. important it is to your body and how much it helps your body yeah and and that's honestly fatigue itself and lethargy that's how i found out i had low test because i was in mm -hmm. nimi you know like you said your sleep you're not even if you aren't hanging out with your boys you're not fucking staying up too late watching movies on the weekends whatever you're getting like, I remember my last, certainly my last year at NIMI, I was living off of five hours of sleep a night easily between my classes, right, between during mm -hmm. all this other extracurricular bullshit that I was doing. And, you know, just how uh, extracurricular sleep, uh, stress relievers that were going on at the time. Um, I just, you know, I just got to a point where I was like, I'm not sleeping. I am not sleeping yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. I can get I, through it. I can make it. Yeah. I will sleep through fucking spring break. I will sleep at Christmas. I will sleep at Thanksgiving. That is when the sleep will happen right now. I'll just suffer. So I was tired the whole right. time. And so I get out and all my friends, you know, even through high school, you know, we're all tired. Everyone's tired. So you don't really think about it. You don't think about how important all that sleep is and what have you. Mm -hmm. But then I got out of there and, you know, in the back half of like 2017, you know, I was just a fucking mess, went through a bad breakup, drank too much, whatever. But like in 2018, I remember I, I just got to a point where I was like, okay, why am I still tired? Like I'm, I'm not doing nearly as much as I was at NIMI. Why am I still just suffering right now mentally? And so I was like, all right, I'm going to force myself seven to eight hours of sleep, five nights a week. No shit. Right. If I go out drinking, if I go out partying, if I'm fucking up playing video games, whatever, you can do that on Friday and Saturday nights. But like no shit, Sunday through Thursday, you are eight to seven hours of sleep. And I did that for a long while. And I was still just fucking dead. Never really cared about it. Flash all the way forward, all this insanity about the covid vaccine and about this but it got to my head i'm not gonna lie i was like oh fuck i'm gonna right. you know what I, I have health insurance i'm just gonna do it i'm gonna get my blood panels done and i'm going to 
see what's up with my body. And sure enough, I had the test levels of a fucking 65 year old man. And I was like, thanks. Love that. Um, right. But I think just going back to the conversation of what can you do before you start entertaining these things? Um, prior prioritizing sleep, prioritizing nutrition and getting all these things right. That's, it could it be more crucial to mm-hmm. what you're doing for yourself. And then as a natural, you know, yeah, you can train really hard. You can eat right and do all these things for three, four five years, but you can never really know once like before you, if you decide to cross over into that next playing field, you can always change up your nutrition. You can always change up your fucking training routine. You can always, there's, right. it's like, it's like mental Legos. There's so many custom things that you can do, but this, the, what I, into my opinion, anyway, the negative part of going over to gear for most people, not everyone, but for most people, mm-hmm. if you take enough, whatever enough is for you, Mm-hmm. You can never go back. Yeah. You can never go back to just being a natural, to just having stable test levels. It'll, they'll always drop. They'll always fluctuate. And you'll always have to be on sub, some kind of supplemental therapy. And it's just, and again, it's just worrying to me how much social media, because like, I'm sure you saw this when the Facebook whistleblower came out. And yeah. there was the big thing about, oh, we're allowing people or countries like Russia and China and Iran, they, inf- they influence our social media. Okay, fine. But there was a – on Facebook. But there was a secondary piece of evidence or information that came out where it was the demographic of people most affected and then specifically getting eating disorders from Instagram was – Women between the ages of 11 and 24, 23. And, or no, I'm sorry, 13. 13 to 24 or 23. And, right. you know, I, I really do believe that in the next 8 to 15 years, there's going to be another study where it's like, well, how many dudes are getting that? Because mm-hmm. body dysmorphia, you know, as you would know as well as I do by dysmorphia is on both spectrums. It's I'm too skinny, but it's also, I'm not big enough yeah. and I will never be big enough. And yeah. you know, it's like how much you want to push that. And that's why, unfortunately we're seeing these bodybuilders drop at the age of 35, 38, 40, mid forties. That's why they're dying. Like they're dedicating their lives to this thing and what's coming out now, a lot of like nothing obviously corroborated by like uh, credentialed universities or God knows what, but like there's a lot of common denominators that it's IGF one that's killing a mm. lot of these guys of what, it, how much uh, taxation is done to the organs and done to the right. heart. And then obviously you just have fucking monsters like Rich Piana who put everything into their body. God bless yeah. him, but he loved it. But he loved it. He knew. He loved what he did. Yeah. yeah. He, he loved the death warrant he was signing. You know, and it's just, yeah. I, th- I don't think that message is just being shown enough or just the importance of that's being shown enough to the younger generation, just in my opinion. Right. I, you know, I look at it like you mentioned with body dysmorphia, how, you know, you jump on Instagram right now. And your feed is going to be about, even if you're like really looking into, you know, these top level physique guys or these power lifters, you're watching this and like, I'm not like that. And you start looking and there's going to be those pictures of the girls with beautiful bodies right after that. And it's like, well, maybe if I look like that, I'll be able to get that. And then you start thinking about, well, maybe if I look like that, you know, I'll feel better about myself. And then you go look in the mirror and you're like, damn, you know, I need to lose a little bit here. Or I wish my biceps would get bigger. or I wish my traps were a little bit more defined. And it's, like like social media is such a great tool when used properly because it can like if you're trying to broadcast the right mission or the right vision and trying to do the right thing for people you know there is a platform for you to be on but the exact same time i talk about my with uh talk to my friends about this all the time it's like 
you don't necessarily see that as often as you're going to see someone who's almost thirst trapping, even guys thirst trap. It happens all the time. And so <laughs> you're constantly right. And, and so you're constantly like seeing these images of people that are, you know, look better than you or perform higher than you. And it, it affects your, your mental well being. body dysmorphia. It sucks. It sucks because like I can sit there, man, and I'll have people that I'm friends with or whatever be like, Hey bro, you looking slow. Da, 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 da. Like I'm trying to get like you one day. And then I'm sitting there looking at myself like, man, I ain't even where I'm going to be yet. And so you kind of like dismiss what they're saying, but to them, you are gold. And they want to get to that size. They want to get to that strength. They want to get to that definition or whatever the case may be because everyone comes from different routes. And, you know, by all means, just because I have certifications, that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm a, I'm a professional in this field. I'm, I technically am, but it's like I don't think I know enough, nor do I ever think I'm going to know it all. And so kind of adding all that together, man, is it's, I feel almost like it's a discredit to people when you look at your body or, man, I, your own self-image that you broadcast, your confidence in yourself, the amount of time you put into yourself, whether it's, you know, disciplinary actions and your diet and food, but also like the willingness to learn more like i mean we've talked about a little bit with like getting certifications and expanding your knowledge i felt like in a general sense that i would be doing a disservice to the army if i didn't enlist and deploy before i ever even thought about becoming an officer right and so i carry that same mentality with my physical fitness is that i feel like i'll do a disservice to you and try to teach you something that i have no idea that i don't i know nothing about and so i go take classes or I try to expand train with different people and you know get their thoughts and their knowledge so that one day I can pass that down in a better package than I received it and that's ultimately how I've led to you know my own fitness and the fitness of the people around me is that how can I continue to learn how can I continue to improve myself so I can broadcast the image of what right looks like if that makes sense so yeah man it's it's tough no that's dope dude and I think you have really good uh, outlook and a good approach on, you know, carrying that vision forward. And I think that's what's going to give you longevity is the fact that it's like, yeah, you're right. I don't know everything, but I'll find you an answer. And right. you go out and you do that. And whether that answer takes an hour or a couple years, you will eventually mm-hmm. be able to give new people that answer that maybe you couldn't answer for somebody else. And so right. Considering everything that we've discussed around the fitness industry and the, your look, your outlook on it, your vision towards what you want to do personally, what made you want to take that next step? And be like, you know what? I really want to, I really do want to help people. I'm going to start, which I love, by the way, your fucking logo is dope as shit. Yeah, that grindhouse uh, logo. Yeah, send me a picture of it so I can throw it up on here. Um, I, okay. I love your logo. Where did that idea come from? The initiative to go do it? And what's your like, mm-hmm. you know, you don't have to spill all the beans, but like, what's your vision yeah. for it going forward? So uh, kind of starting off, um, I look at it a lot that my physical fitness is focused around the sense of how I'm training, where I want to be able to be that tactical athlete in the sense of where if I was to deploy tomorrow, would I be able to get my buddies out of a combat zone? Would I be able to get them out of the firefight? Would I be able to make sure that we all return home safe one day, right? Can we make those promises? We can't in certain senses because we can't control everything, but we can't control what we can't control. And that's kind of where my my goal with uh, Grindhouse was. Is Grindhouse was formed in the sense of, like I said, with NIMI, we called the training program down there Grindhouse. And so I kind of used that same title um, as my implication of like where I came from and adding it to who I currently am. Um, That logo actually was centered around, you know, I have a powerhouse shirt on right now to where I I train and you always see like the big gyms always got someone with a a barbell doing stuff. It's just like, (laughs) it's, it's the look. And so I was like, okay, how can I, how can I grab that look and make it my own, but also broadcast my image? Cause I could, I could post a really buff guy deadlifting and you know, that could be, cool like that would be a normal gym photo but I was like okay but I want to focus more on getting soldiers right like if I could tell you my perfect business scheme it would be that I would have a facility where we have people that maybe just gone through MEPS or whatever are thinking thinking about joining the military you come to us 
right? And we will train you on, you know, PRT, teach you these calisthenic movements and how can we utilize strength training to better you on your ACFT or, you know, as I expand getting into people in the Marine Corps and the Navy, whatever their departments we want to talk about with tactical athletes, how can you come to us and we prepare you to be the best person where you're going? And so I looked at it and I was like, okay, well, what if I do somebody who is pretty much like tacked out? You know, he's wearing his, I think he has a cry play carrier on. Like I designed, like when I sent him what I wanted, I was like, yeah, I want cry, uh, pretty much play carrier. I want to have to cry pants on, da, 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 da. I, I did a little bit of research on all that. And uh, I was like, I want him to broadcast what I, you know, would want if you were to look at, I, one of my, actually kind of jumping back, when I was overseas, we were doing a, uh, a competition, like a best squad competition. And there was a couple of us on the team that were just big swole body type guys. And there was a guy from, I think it was, I think it was Albania. He was like, if that's what the Americans look like, I don't think I ever want to fight them. And <laughs> that right there, that right there was like okay bro like the ego just went out the roof you know like you know, i could get here right there and be done and we're good to go it's called hamburgers it like... and whiskey son that's what happens <laughs> yeah man that like mcdarrell's but dude i just i saw that and i was like that's that's the image that i want i want to demonstrate you know not just how a soldier should act but also how a soldier should be able to maintain their fitness i should be able to go in there and get a plus 500 score in my acft you know, when I need to, that, that should just be an average. That should be what is expected out of me. And when I do those higher 500 scores, then that that's, you know, exceeding the limit or exceeding the standard, whatever case may be. So I've, I've really tried to transfer that into my grind out into grind house to where the people I have that come in to train with me, um, you know, I have people that are just general fitness that I train that are not military at all. And we put together programs on that, but we kind of use like that military I guess, like structure in the sense of, you know, you come in here and we're going to do our mobility, stretching. We're going to walk through all these and then we're going to go through our main training program and then we'll do some recovery. And I kind of use terminology to make it seem like it's much more military than what we're really doing. Like I'm not actually walking them through PRT, but I'm kind of leading them in that, uh, that direction. And then I have my people that are just strength oriented. They just want to go in there and really get stronger, put on some muscle and that's great too. But, you know, perfect world in the future. I would love to see to where I could have these guys getting ready to ship out, come to me. We train them for a couple months. They go to basic and they come back and like, yo, like I was a distinguished honor grad or, yo, I got a, a 550 on my ACFT. And, you know, a couple months down the road, like, hey, I'm going to Ranger. Hey, I'm going to Aerosol. Hey, I'm going, you know, doing all these great things. And, you know, we kind of set them up for success because that wasn't something I had. Like I said, I and I was co turned no idea what I was to expect. I mean, I don't really know. I saw them do PRT, but physical fitness experience was, you know, athletic room type training. Not how can I do max push-ups or how can I run a two mile more effectively and stuff like that. So it just, I'm, I'm really trying to better my ability to broadcast what I've learned to others so that the next generation of soldiers could be far better than what I was and the people that are around me. And that's kind of literally how I, I think about it day in, day out. How can, how can I make it better? How can I have my, you know, my hand on what the Army is going to be of the next generation? It's pretty much the whole factor of what it's going to be. You know, I, uh, before we close out, I'm going to be a little selfish, man. Like, this is one of the things that I love the most about doing this podcast is I get to sit down and kick it, you know, with my friends. I learn more about them and I, um, I get to see a better insights, like what their vision for the future is, what their, what their goals are for the future. And, right. you know, when I hear something like that, it's like, okay, I knew this dude and I heard the vision before he made his millions. So yeah. good to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, man, man I, I, I always hope money comes, you know, that's always an idea of like, I want to make good money, but that's not where my satisfaction would come from it at the same time. You know, that, that'd be great if my program succeeds. And that would be great if, you know, one day I could have multiple locations. But at the end of the day, my main focus to where we're eventually going to be tested for our country will be tested. That's just how it's going to be. That's who we are. We are the superpower of the world right now. And at some point, someone's going to try to check us. And I want to be able to have my hand on to know that, I prepared people the best I possibly can for when that moment comes. And that's ultimately what it is, man. I mean, 
like we've talked about before is that some of our moments with the army is skewed. I have my problems where I've had those toxic leadership moments. I've had those times where I wanted to get out. I've had those times where I hated putting on my uniform at times because it's just, it had that much of an effect on my mental state. And if I can be the person for someone to get them out of that realm and get them to where they can exceed the standards and become not just a great soldier, but you know, a great, I guess you call them like a lifelong learner and a role model in a sense for somebody, man. And that's satisfaction enough. Like uh, I always look at it like, if it was all for one person, if I was to do everything I've been gone through my whole life and, well, you know, past like growing up lessons to NIMI lessons, to military lessons, to figuring it out by myself lessons, if it was all for one person, man, it was worth it. And that's how I try to carry on my whole leadership mentality. And hopefully one day as, you know, the years go on, um, I can, I can have that impact on more than just one person. And hopefully so maybe if I ever have kids one day, it'll be on to them and they can carry on that same legacy. So not, at the end of the day, man, it's just, we all want to find a way to make the world a better place in our own way. And I think mine, I, I truly think that my calling is, is just, you know, raising the next generation of leaders. And I think physical fitness is such a predominant portion of leadership to where if once you go through the weight room or, you know, calisthenics and army training, um, it's not that the PT score is what changes you, but, People that normally are in like a upper level of physical fitness, their self-confidence level is different, right? You, you carry yourself differently. And then also, like I said, with all your you know, tactical environment basis, you're, you're able to perform at a higher level. And then you add all this together with the lifelong learning then, and it's just, I'm, I'm so passionate about that. I'm so passionate about being able to see what the next step is for you know, the people I train and also for our country, because you know, I'm not red, white, and blue, Mr. Hua Hua at all times, man. I think our country got our fair share of stuff that needs to change. We have a lot of things that need to, you know, go into opposite directions or continue moving into others. And I also see how the heart of our country is kind of like, we're losing confidence in ourselves and that's not what we never want. But if I can have a positive impact, like I said, on just one of those people that can lead the change in the future, man, um, you know, my, my life was a success. My life was a success. So that's awesome, man. That's that's fucking that's inspiring to be honest. Uh that's awesome, man. I'm glad you have that mindset. Um but this was a pleasure, dude. I'm really happy that yeah, we dude. got to sit down and do this finally. And right. it, seriously a pleasure. Thank you. I really appreciate you sitting down with me, man. You cut up, I didn't hear what you said. Oh yeah, I think we, I, that's a great time to cut out, right? <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear I, you. you know. Yeah, that's so a great far. time to yeah. cut out, right? Jesus Christ! Yeah, cut out. Um, hard. No, yeah, but it was like I said, man. It's just a pleasure to sit down with you. And um, yeah. whenever, if I find myself on the east side, or if you ever back in Arizona, we'll figure something out, and I'll drive out and do this in person. This is a fucking blast, dude. Oh, for sure, dude. In the in the do in due time, man, I definitely see myself getting back out there. And that's where I kind of really want grind have to take off anyway, is out west. Um, I think like I look out here, bro, and this this the East Coast has like some mecca of gyms. I have some like great gyms to train at. But I really want to be able to focus in and you know, settle down in Arizona and everything. So one day, brother, we're gonna make that happen. And when I'm driving through, I'm definitely gonna hit you up. Hell yeah, man. All right, like I said, dude, it was a pleasure. Uh, absolute yeah, blast and I appreciate everyone else listening and watching as usual and uh, we'll see you guys next time bye everybody oh.